So near the beginning of the posterior analytics, Aristotle describes a true science as one in which fit into a deductive and demonstrative structure are, and I quote, things which are true and primitive and immediate and more familiar than and prior to and explanatory of the science's various conclusions. In the last chapter of this same work, he gives an account of these things that are true and primitive, etc., and how knowledge of them is acquired. We get to know them, he says, by induction. It's a very crucial term in his uh, philosophy. Very complicated, actually. Uh, induction involves perception, memory, and experience, which in turn involves universals that come to rest in the soul. In other words, these universals enter the human way by way of perception of particulars, although of particulars grasped right from the beginning, although not fully, as instances of universals. It is intellect, nous, that grasps the first principles of science. The relationship between intellect and the universals it grasps in the particulars <coughs> is specific and direct. It eventually results in names corresponding to definitions that refer necessarily to the particular things experienced. Although in this apparently, apparently definitive final chapter of the posterior analytics, Aristotle describes the first principles of science and their acquisition in this manner, there are many places in the Aristotelian corpus, including places in genuinely scientific works, that speak in a decidedly looser manner of, way, uh, of the way that words refer to things in the world that is, in a way that is less specific and direct. I hope that uh, Father, uh, Father uh, Professor O'Callaghan doesn't object to what I've just said there. Words with origins, origins in other contexts and with their own specific definitions are used to refer to things whose proper definitions correspond to other words. Aristotle harbors no antipathy for such ways of, of speaking. The process of reasoning, as Aristotle sometimes describes it, is therefore much more fluid than what we find in, in the posterior analytics in 2.19. I'll just refer to that, ch that chapter as 2.19. Essential to reasoning and even to progress in knowledge appears to be a certain freedom regarding the application of words. Indeed, with the exception of 2.19, Aristotle appears quite open to the use of what recent philosophers of science refer to as models. The structure of what I, I'll say is fairly simple. I shall go through a selection, certainly not a, an exhaustive selection of passages where, Aristotle, where Aristotle's ways of using words is different from what we see in 219, or at least appears to be. Section one considers what can be called analogies. Section two considers paradigms. <clears throat> and section three considers metaphors. In fact, for time, I'm not sure how, how much about I'll be able to say about the metaphors. And then in the last section, which I think is, uh, would be more important, I come back to the question of the relationship between the use of models and Aristotle's remarks in 219. <clears throat> so let us begin with uh, analogies. <clears throat> Daniela Baylor Jones defines scientific model as, and I quote, an interpretive description of a phenomenon that facilitates access to that phenomenon. She goes on then to explain that, and I quote, facilitating access usually involves focusing on specific aspects of a phenomenon, sometimes deliberately dis um, disregarding others. Scientific models include, therefore, <clears throat> analogies, which do precisely that. They call attention to parallel phenomena. Indeed, while even acknowledging, sometimes even emphasizing that the two sides of the parallel are quite different. And Baylor-Jones gives an example. 
The electrons in an atom are related to the atomic nucleus, like the planets are related to the sun. And here's another quotation. Both the motion of electrons and planets is determined by an attractive force, which is why they orbit around the atomic nucleus and the sun respectively. Even though the causes of attraction are not the same, gravitational versus electrostatic, which is why the relationships, the relationships are perhaps more correctly called comparable rather than identical. End of quotation. When the term analogia occurs in the text of Aristotle, with good reason, translators tend to render it rather as proportion, for the term's roots are in mathematics. Consider, for example, the following passage from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, in which he describes uh, distributive justice, and I quote, the just then is a series of the, is a species of the proportionate, analogon, the proportionate being not a property only of the kind of number which consists of abstract units, but of number in general. For proportion, analogia, is equality of ratios, logon, and involves four terms at least. And the just two involves at least four terms, and the ratio is the same. For there is a similar distinction between the persons, the persons and between the things. As term A then is to be, so C will be to be, uh, to D, and therefore alternando, as A is to C, B will be to D. End of quotation, obviously. Later, later philosophers will refer to the relationship here described as analogy of proportionality. Let us say that for some reason Mr. A is deserving of a greater share of certain goods than is Mr. B, so that A's worthiness can be assigned the number two, and Mr. B's the number one. There are 12 goods of equal worth to be distributed. A judge gives eight of them C to Mr. A and four of them D to Mr. B. The, re the, re the result is ratios differing insofar as they contain different figures, that is numbers, values, that is two, eight, and one, and four, but an equal proportion, but an equal proportion since qua ratios, two to eight and one to four are equal. The thing to notice here is that things that, is, that in one sense are different, in another sense are the same. This latter characteristic is what encouraged later commentaries to use the term analogy of relationships of which Aristotle did not use that term. It is also what allows all these analogies to qualify as scientific models. One entity or arrangement can be quite different from a second entity or arrangement, and yet bringing the two together and thinking about them sheds intellectual light upon the second and even perhaps upon the first with respect to the second. There are a couple of passages in Aristotle's mes metaphysics which can be and have been called analogies. And it's important, the fact, that these appear in the, in the metaphysics because, as you all know, Aristotle re regards the metaphysics as science in the strict sense. That is knowledge, episteme. In a well-known passage in Metaphysics 4.2, that is book 4, uh, uh, chapter 2, we read the following. Again, I'm sure you, you, you all know this passage, but we'll just, I'll just read it. Anyhow, he says that there are many senses in which a thing may be said to be, but they are related to one thing, pros hen, one particular nature, and are not homonymous. Everything which is healthy is related to health, one thing in the sense that it preserves health, health, another in the sense that it produces it, another in the sense that it is a symptom of health, another because it is capable of it. So too there are many senses in which a thing is said to be, but all refer to one starting point. Some things are said to be because they are substances, others because they are affections of substances or accidents, 
others because they are a process toward substance or, or destructions or provations or qualities of substance or productive of or generative of substances or of things which are relative to substances or negations of some of the things um, of, some, of some things or of substances themselves. Anyhow, so um, here again in this quotation, as with the <clears throat> analogy of proportionality, the various terms at issue have different senses, and yet by attending to the way in which they differ, we perceive also how these senses are united. In this sense, a group of accepted senses are united insofar as they look back to one sense which is primary. And that concept, look back to, is, is important. The sense of the word healthy as said of exercise and the sense of the word healthy as said of a symptom depend upon the sense of healthy as said of the body. Similarly, the sense in which Homer's being taller than his sister is, that is, has being, and the sense in which his blindness is, both depend upon the quite different sense of being by virtue of which Homer is a substance. This relationship, this pros hen relationship, later to be called analogy of attribution, is what allows Aristotle to understand and describe the complex character of what comes to be known as the ens commune, especially, obviously, in the Latin tradition. One might argue that it is the method metho methodological key to a large portion of Aristotle's metaphysics, that portion which is sometimes called ontology, as distinct from metaphysics itself. Another analogical relationship is also presented in, in that same chapter, that is 4.2 of the metaphysics, although, although it is not as well known as the pros hen relationship. A bit further on in 4.2, Aristotle says that the unity of beings is not the unity of a universal or of something separate, that is separate in the sense that Plato used that term, but rather some are related, in this quotation, some are related to one thing, pros hen, some are one by succession, tois effexes. Whereas a pros hen relationship, um, in that sort of relationship, the united senses are recognized senses that look back to the sense upon which they depend. In a relationship of unity by succession, there is first one thing, there is the first thing, then a second, then possibly a third and a fourth, and so on. The things related to that first thing in the succession begun with the second thing are quite possibly yet to be discovered. This makes this other type of analogy by succession useful as a characterization of some scientific investigation, which might not be a matter of organizing information already established, but a matter, rather, of using a model in order to go toward something that is not yet fully known and may never be known in the fuller sense that the first elements in the, sec in the succession are known. The mention of these two types of analogy in Metaphysics 4.2 is also a help in arguing for at least some level of unity in the entire work. I might mention also that that second type, that is the um, uh, analogy by succession, is not very, I, in fact, I mentioned it's not very well known, but uh, in fact, it's discussed by Alexander of Aphrodisius in, in, in some detail, and uh, which it, uh, I much uh, recommend his commentary on the, um, on the metaphysics, at least the part that's uh, genuinely by, by him. Anyhow, so uh, the mention of these two types of analogy um, also helps in arguing for at least some level of unity in that entire work, that is, in the metaphysics. A, com a common argument for the work's lack of unity calls attention to the fact that large sections of that work are about being, of the types of being that we find in the world, 
whereas the twelfth book is about a transcendent being called by God, called by, excuse me, called by Aristotle God or the God or sometimes the divine, depending on the translation. In the prologue to his commentary on the metaphysics, Thomas Aquinas maintains that ens commune, that is the subject of the discipline of metaphysics, that is the subject of metaphysics, does not include the causes of that subject, including the ultimate cause, the first unmoved mover. Metaphysics begins with the consideration of ens commune and moves towards a consideration of ens commune's causes. So, <clears throat> although God or the divine is not included in the pros hen analogical relationship, the primary and most intelligible type of being in that relationship, that is substance, can be used as a model in seeking some understanding of the transcendent substance, which or who is the first unmoved mover. mover. So I move on now to paradigms, another uh, type of model. On at least one occasion, Aristotle uses the Greek uh, term uh, uh, paradigma in order to refer to what he might have called analogy. That word is usually translated example, although in this case the transliteration, that is paradigm, seems to me more appropriate since Aristotle speaks in this regard not simply of an example, but of an example that serves as an applicable parallel, that is a sort of model. In the passage which occurs in the second book of the rhetoric, he is introducing what he identifies as the common types of persuasion, pistis. They are twofold. The enthymeme, a sort of abbreviated or elliptical syllogism, and the paradigm. And here's what he says about paradigms. We will first treat of persuasion by paradigm, for the paradigm is similar to induction, induction being primary, and that's probably a reference to what we've seen in the posterior analytics. There are two types of paradigms. One is characterized by a person's mention of past events. The other by a person's own activity, autan poien. Of the latter, and I kind of number this uh, 2A, the first, that is 2A, is juxtaposition, parabole, and the other is fable. In fact, I won't talk much about fable because it's, it's more or less uh, obvious. The mention, of event, the mention of events, that is past events, um, is, uh, works like this as if someone should say that it is necessary to prepare for war against the king of Persia and not let him enter, uh, not let him, let him conquer Egypt. For earlier, Darius did not cross over the Aegean Sea before he seized, seized Egypt, but having seized it, he, didn't, he did in fact cross over. And again, Xerxes did not attack until he had seized Egypt, but having seized it, he did cross over. So also, if the king um, seizes Egypt, he will cross over. That, therefore, must not be permitted. So he must attack. So it's, it's kind of an, an analogy, so to, um, uh, a sort of analogy kind of based on, on past events. Juxtaposition, on the other hand, that is <coughs> to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Two-way in that uh, initial um, paragraph uh, is found in the Socratic arguments. For instance, if someone says those selected by lot lot ought not to rule, for that is if someone should select athletes by lot, not those comp ca uh, capable of competing, but those whom it might fall to by lot. Or is it like selecting by lot? from among the seafarers, which of them should be the steersman, as if that ought, to, ought not to be the man who knows how to steer a ship, but rather the man on whom the lot falls. 
So it's just a, uh, uh, it's a, um, a comparison, a juxtaposition. The, dis the distinction between um, paradigms characterized by mention of past events and what we might call free juxtaposition, that is by our own activity, um, uh, is present among scientific models. Paradigms of the former type can be quite quotidian and their application may not even be noticed by those who in effect make use of them. Think of a researcher who is already familiar with the gene sequence in one species of fish and now recognize, recognizes later a similar sequence in another species of fish. Paradigms of the other type those characterized by a person's own uh, activity are more deliberative and creative. Johannes Kepler was faced with the task, task of explaining why the planets farther away from the sun move more slowly than the planets, planets closer in. He speculated that this had more to do with the sun, the vis motrix, than with the planets. Exploring, exploring this possibility explains uh, Baylor Jones, whom I quoted before. Kepler, and I quote, Kepler drew on, on, analogy, on an analogy to light. The light receives from a light source, the, the light received from a light source uh, per area also thins out with distance. The farther away, the lower the intensity of the light received. Such free just, juxtaposition <clears throat> might occasionally prove unreliable, but they are, are potentially more fruitful, as was Kepler's, regard, Kepler's attempt you know, regarding the planets. It's worth noting also in a parallel passage in the uh, prior analytics on paradigms, where he speaks similarly of military campaigns, Aristotle emphasizes the difference between the use of paradigms and induction. In order to show that D, that is war by Athens against Thebes, is evil, says Aristotle, one proceeding by paradigm, by, per, per, uh, by paradigm must presume that a major term, A, evil, holds of a minor, minor term, that is war against neighboring countries. This would give us a valid syllogism. That is, A, that is A evil supposes, supposedly holds of B, war against neighboring countries. Uh, clearly, B holds of T, of D, that is, war against Thebes. Um, but how does one show that A does hold of B? Someone might use as a paradigm C, that is, the Thebans' war against the Phoenicians. Um, which or uh, Phocians, which is proved to be evil for which proved to be evil for Thebes. This does not establish that A holds a B the way um, induction would, at least induction as understood in the posterior analytics. But it does afford some evidence. The unfortunate war by the Thebans against the, the Phocians serves as a sort of model. The paradigmer can then argue that. Since A holds a B and B holds a C, not to mention C, A holds also a D. I think I'll, I'll skip here to, um, to metaphors. Uh, there's another um, type of paradigm which is uh, even more complicated. In fact, it kind of violates the uh, uh, basically the, the terms of or the the rules of mathematical um, uh, that proportion and, uh, uh, and that's interesting and uh, but again it just shows that that, that when under when Ersal understands a, a, a model or in in that case a, a paradigm he he doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be um, uh, a strict uh, mathematical relationship between the various things in the in the um, proportion so we'll shift to, to metaphors and say a bit about those. <clears throat> so this is uh, basically the, the third part on metaphor. There is also a place in Aristotle's poetics where he speaks of metaphor, met, met, metaphora, as the application epiphora, or epiphora of words in, and speaks of them in various uh, inventive ways. <clears throat> 
from species, from genus to species, from species to genus, and from species to species, or according to proportion. This latter being a translation of kata analogon, <coughs> which might also, of course, be rendered according to analogy. The first three way ways of applying words, that is from genus to species, from species to genus, and from species to species, we moderns do not immediately recognize as metaphorical, although they are all taken from poems, as one would expect in a work on poetry. In fact, one of the poems, we don't really know which it is, which it is but uh, it's clearly a, um, a poetical use. For the first of these uh, types, um, Aristotle uses uh, Athena's assertion in the Odyssey, and I quote, Yonder stands my ship, where the word stands, uh, estiken, takes the place of is anchored, which is a more specific way of standing. We see here how commonplace for Aristotle metaphors might be. Aristotle's second example is somewhat more poetic. At one point in the Iliad, the Achaeans exclaim, using a, you know, a phrase which, which suggests exclamation, that Ulysses did 10,000 good deeds instead of their saying more banally that Ulysses did many good things, many being the genus of 10,000. The origins of, the, of Aristotle's third example, from species to species, um, are not known. This is the one poem which we haven't been able to identify. He quotes two phrases, having extracted the, by, the soul by bronze, that is sword point, and having taken by bronze sword point. He points out that in the first case, to have extracted is being used of to have taken. And in the second, to have taken is used instead of to have extracted, the two words falling under the genus to remove. It is clear that this example is meant to illustrate um, poetic embellishment by means of what we would call metaphor, since the two words, that is, rusos et temnon, are on the same level are on the same level. Aristotle's particular point here is that these words, not, notwithstanding discernible but minor differences of meaning, are interchangeable. His more general point in this section of the poetics is that metaphor is simply a shifting, that is a metaphoring to or a application of, that is epiphering as we already see, saw, another word in a particular context. And in fact, what he's talking about there is, in fact, those two words are two species falling under a genus, and, 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 and uh, so it's just an, an illustration of that. In presenting the fourth type of metaphor, according to proportion or according to analogy, Aristotle uses an example which is not unlike, but also interestingly di different from what he says in, in the Nic Nicomachean Ethics 5.3 where, as, as, as we have seen, he offers the mathematically sound equivalence as the term A then is to B, so will C be to B, and therefore alternando as A is to C, B will be to D. Here, too, in the poetics, he speaks of four interrelated terms, although in this case the equivalence he, he draws would be mathematically incorrect, word part of that discipline. He says that proportional um, metaphor, and I quote, is possible whenever there, there are four terms so related that the first is to the first as the fourth is to the third. For one may then put the fourth in the place of the second and the second in the place of the fourth. And in fact, in mathematics, as I go on to explain there, um, that simply doesn't work, but it, it does work uh, again in terms of uh, uh, metaphor. I've got 15 more minutes, so I think I'll just skip that last bit there and go to uh, section four, which again comes back to the um, that uh, important uh, 
chapter in the posterior analytics. At the beginning of chapter 22 of the Poetics, Aristotle says that the language of poetry should be clear and not mean. He acknowledges that excellence in language uh, would make use of proper words for things, and that phrase is important, we'll see. Um, although limiting oneself to those words, he said, would be mean or excessively austere. Better, better to use a combination of proper and figurative words. It's, it's also interesting that, that uh, I, I think it is maybe in a, quote, in a quotation which I skipped over, that, is that when he talks about um, the poetics uh, in poetry, he says that in, in this use of, of uh, you know, kind of metaphor, et cetera, in, in, in poems, he says that's, that's proper to the, the truly intelligent uh, person and, 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 uh, and cultured person. And, and so in, in no sense is, does he consider, consider this, you know, kind of uh, a, second, a secondary way of, of thinking. Anyhow, so having, having offered a number of examples of how this might, might be done, Aristotle remarks, um, uh, as follows. It is a great thing to make fitting use of the aforementioned figurative expressions as also of compounds and obsolete words, but much the greatest thing is to be apt at metaphors, for it is not only this, for it is only this that cannot be learned from another, and it is an indication of cleverness for to employ metaphor well is to contemplate similarity. It's an end of the quotation. In fact, I used this recently in, in, in uh, writing a review about James Joyce, where, again, J James Joyce just uses strange words, and, and, and you find uh, uh, in much the way that, that Aristotle has in mind here. It is apparent that here that, that Aristotle harbors no antipathy for metaphors and their like, nor presumably for scientific models per se, although he does assign a special authoritative status to the proper words for things. And, and actually, that's a quotation, and, and I'll talk about that, that word proper in, in what follows. This special authoritative status has, that is of certain words has been deemed, deemed unacceptable by a number of relatively recent authors. Paul Ricoeur, for example, rejects the characterization of meta metaphor as a re-description of reality, which makes it, he suggests, a sort of ornament tacked on to the proper description. For Ricoeur, the hermeneutical context of metaphor is there right from the beginning, and I quote, the idea of an initial metaphorical impulse destroys these oppositions between proper and figurative, ordinary and strange, order and transgression. It suggests the idea that order itself proceeds from the metaphorical constitution of semantic fields, which themselves give rise to genus and species. So the metaphorical is primary. By order, Ricoeur has in mind here the aristity and taxonomy of species and genus alluded to in the posterior analytics that is uh, at the beginning of the second book and also worked out in the categories. Hans-Georg Gadamer's uh, attitude is similar, although his antipathy is directed towards what he calls Aristotle's ideal of logical proof, by which he means the deductive and demonstrative structure of the posterior analytics in general, with its basis in the prior analytics, uh, um, or no, with its basis in, in posterior analytics 219, as we saw. Also, there is a basic, there's a basis in the uh, prior analytics, that is the, the logic, pro properly speaking. And I quote, um, for Aristotle, he complains, that is Gadamer, uh, for Aristotle, the logical idea of the ordered arrangement of concepts takes precedence over the living metaphoricity of language on which all natural concepts uh, on, on, on which all natural concept formation depends. 
for only a grammar based on logic will distinguish between the proper and the metaphorical meaning of the word. What originally constituted the basis of life, of language, and its logical productivity, the spontaneous and the inventive seeking out of similarities by means of which it is possible to order things is now marginalized by Aristotle and instrumentalized into a rhetorical figure called metaphor. And finally, Mary Hess, in her book, Models and Analogies in Science, asks, and I quote, whether it is not in the concept of university, uh, in, the, in the concept of university rather than analogy that obscurity remains. So again, all these are, are, are interpreting Aristotle in a way uh, which, uh, um, according to which he dismisses uh, uh, non-scientific language uh, in a neg negative manner. And, uh, and, and she asks whether there might not be a parallel possibility that all predication is analogical, all of it. In other words, that it is not that analogy is a queer and inexplicable <coughs> hybrid, but rather that university is at best an oversimplification and at worst a highly misleading myth. Hess acknowledges that Aristotle speaks positively of metaphor in both the rhetoric and the po poetics, but she immediately laments that, and I quote, this use depends on the existence of non-metaphoric descriptions. Discourse cannot consist wholly of metaphor for, and she quotes, a whole stat statement in such terms will be either a riddle or a barbarism. In other words, metaphorical discourse is parasitic upon univocal and logically reducible to it. This latter statement misrepresents Aristotle's actual position, although it is a misrepresentation, the exposition of which helps to understand in what sense Aristotle regards the proper as enjoying precedence over the figurative. As suggested earlier, the word kurios, as referring to words and their meanings as described in the posterior analytics, is probably not best translated as proper. The translation proper suggests that the other words are improper, and as Hess would have it, that they are ultimately to be reduced to the proper words and their meanings. That understanding, however, is impossible to square, for example, with what Aristotle says in Metaphysics 4.2 about the pros-hen relationships. The sense of is in which Homer's blindness is is quite different from the sense in which Homer, that substance, is, and it is not re reducible to it. A similar thing can be said of the metaphor involving, involved in saying that yonder sta stands my ship instead of yonder is anchored my ship. The, the word stands is hardly reducible to is anchored. Aristotle is not at, at all in favor of reducing all figurative words to their so-called proper sense. Hess, as we have seen, also says that metaphorical discourse is, discourse is parasitic upon what she calls un univocal, that is, induction-generated discourse. Although the word parasitic is derogatory, it comes quite close to describing accurately the relationship between the figurative and metaphorical usages and that which is proper for the former depends upon the latter for their very sense or even being that is depending on them. A less derogatory way of describing this relationship would be to say that the words defined by induction are the governing words, uh, that is, uh, curia uh, uh, onamita, the figurative or metaphysical or metaphorical to be understood in reference to them. With good reason, Aristotle says that if a poet were to use only figurative discourse and exclude governing words altogether, the result would be either obscurity or barbarism. And that's the piece that she, she quotes. Figurative discourse does indeed bring out in a welcome manner aspects of the concrete world in which we live, but we do not live solely in the figurative. A similar thing can be said of science. 
that per impossible would be made up entirely of models as useful and indeed as essential to scientific investigation as they are models do depend for their sense upon basic everyday perceptions of things as instances of certain types <clears throat> No, actually, actually, I'm not done. So, 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 so. In fact, I, I uh, kind of skipped over a couple of things because I, I did want to say, make one point uh, related to that last point, and, and, and it has more to do with, um, with ethics and uh, action theory. Uh, than, than with what I've been talking about. And, and just, it's kind of a good illustration of, of the relationship between, between uh, um, you know, kind of the, 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 uh, the primary use of words and their use in metaphors. And uh, there's a passage um, in, in, in fact, Thomas's uh, commentary on the, on the De Anima, where, he, where he's talking about um, uh, actually, you know, uh, Picking up um, what what happens in in induction when we when we pick up uh, uh, knowledge of especially of substances and essences that 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 exist in the world and and he um, and and Thomas Thomas interprets Aristotle correctly I think is saying that that um, that those things at least the the definitions are something that we actually pick up you know in the world we pick up essences and that's and that's how we we acquire knowledge so, so it all comes from the world which is not to say that the truth comes but we're talking about the the definitions and the essences and uh, and and he and he talks and Thomas in, in specifically mentions animals and and uh, picking up kind of uh, essences and species of animals etc and um, it seems to me, and this is something I'll be arguing, you know, in, in the in something I've been in, been writing, is that is that this the same thing very much happens in in action theory, and uh, um, and as I'm sure you um, you those of you who have worked in kind of action theory realize that in in uh, <clears throat> in Thomas's uh, uh, in the Prima Secundae in the in in question 18, a number of places and. Uh, but especially in, in question two, I believe, when he talks about, about um, the uh, external act, the exterior act, and, uh, and he, he describes it very much as a, a certain species. And, uh, and it's, it's very much, and, and, and he, um, I think he, he does very, very, very much think that that, that, is, that is a very basic, uh, you know, kind of perception of the way things exist in the world. An example would be <clears throat> simply the example that he uses is, is, um, is the example of, of stealing. So, so stealing we can actually identify in the world because it has a certain object and, it, and it's, it's, it's almost, and in fact he uses the word species, it's sort of animal that we recognize in the world. And uh, another one would be about, about killing. So you take an action which has an object which is the death of a particular uh, object and uh, and we understand that immediately um, you know uh, in, in fact not in a metaphorical way as as a, an act of killing and um, and I think that in in a lot of um, ethics today uh, especially action theory in fact that's that's often um, ignored you know that basic perception of of acts as particular species and um, in fact, the, the the tendency tends to be and to to emphasize even kind of the, the the sincerity with which we do something that is one's conscience, etc. All of which is has to be brought into action theory and and ethics itself, but without ignoring you know that the, 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 those basic um, perceptions of types of of, of action, and I, I'm thinking of some of my friends who work in uh, new natural law theory who who um, tend uh, to ignore, in fact, these substances that we come across in our moral life. So there's, um, there's one example used by these same, oops, sorry. Um, so that's, that's the 40, 45 minutes. But uh, example, yeah, this is kind of an alarm, yeah. So, um, but um, an example used by uh, 
uh, Germaine Grisey, a good friend of mine, in fact, we're, some, we're from the same parish in, in the United States, but um, is that he, he talks about uh, uh, some young people who steal a car in, in order to go joyriding. And he wants to analyze that as joyriding, and that's and 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 there's the, the injustice is, is in the joyriding. But he doesn't. He, he refuses to say that the problem was that they stole the car, and and uh, and. But in fact, I mean, Thomas would say, no, you know, you're right. You know, it's it's, it's bad to go joyriding, et cetera, et cetera. It's unfair, et cetera. And and but. You know, the basic action, in fact, is, is, is uh, an act of stealing. And a similar kind of more serious one is when they talk about craniotomy. And, 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 and craniotomy, in fact, you know, it's, you know the, it's a particular action identifiable in the world which has an object which, um, in fact, kills uh, a human being. And, uh, and their tendency is, is to say, no, let's just talk about, you know, kind of the larger choice that they, they have in mind. And that's, and again, that larger choice and those intentions, the sincerity, et cetera, very, very important. But, you know, we cannot kind of look away from, from that base, those basic species that we find in the world. So that's just kind of a parallel to, to some of the things that uh, I found in Aristotle. Now I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>